So 159 years ago yesterday, y'all know where you were? 159 years ago, Abraham Lincoln stood on the fields of Gettysburg and spoke approximately 280 words that are now known as the Gettysburg Address. And in the midst of the loss and the sorrow of what was one of the, well, what was the largest loss of American life ever, he brought up a couple of important themes. He talked about the importance of sacrifice, of sacrificing for a greater good. He talked about a nation that would hopefully one day understand that we are all made in the image of God. And in those very brief words as he gave that address, he brought up hope and the desire for the end of slavery. 159 years ago, in November of 1863, What most people don't remember is that a month earlier, Abraham Lincoln had declared that the fourth Thursday of November would be a day for the nation to give thanks to the beneficent God. Beneficent, beneficent. Which one is it? I have my notes because I never can remember. I don't use that word very often. Beneficent, which means generous. God, a day for the entire nation to give thanks. George Washington had talked about it, but Congress had never implemented it. Our good good friend Thomas Jefferson came along and said, we must protect the separation of church and state, so we cannot have a day where the whole nation's gathered, where the whole nation gathers to give praise to the living God. Some things just never change, Right? And then in 1863, in the midst of our Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared that we as a nation need to pause and give thanks and remember our blessings. And so ever since then, although there was a brief gap in there of a couple years when it moved, when the Thursdays moved, that's not important for us, but The last Thursday of November has been a day for us to pause and give thanks and remember all that we are grateful for, even though we live in the midst of what seems like crisis after crisis after crisis. But Lincoln recognized the importance that even amidst the war and the suffering, there was need to pause and give thanks. So that's kind of what we want to be about this morning in our sermon, this idea of thinking through why gratitude matters. To do that, we're going to have to back up a little bit historically, a little bit more than just the days of the Civil War, and we're going to have to go back to the days of the Apostle Paul and go back to the church that he helped to found in the community of Thessalonica or Thessalonica, depending on however it is that you uh, pronounce that. That city of Thessalonica was founded in 315 BC. It had been around for a long, long, long time. It was named after the sister of Alexander the Great. It was a place of great commerce. It was a place of great political power. And so by the time the Apostle Paul arrives in Thessalonica around 49 or 50 AD, it was a very well-known, established, affluent community. And you may recall, this is one of the first churches that the Apostle Paul plants on the continent of Europe. Remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul has the call of the man from Macedonia. No one's nodding their head. This is gonna be a very long morning, right? Paul has the call from the man of Macedonia. He goes over to Macedonia, Greece, and plants the church at Philippi, the first church planted in modern day Europe. From there, he continues on in his journeys. And so, like I said, probably around 49 or 50 AD, he makes his way to Thessalonica. This is his basically his second missionary journey. So I want you to listen 
to how that church in Thessalonica was established. This is verses 1 through 4 of Acts chapter 17. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So as the Apostle Paul, very often as he proclaimed the message of Jesus, he would go into the synagogue to the people of the Jewish faith. He would talk about who Jesus was, what Jesus had done, what Jesus had accomplished. Paul would gather a crowd because there's always this, when the gospel goes out, there's always a crowd that loves to hear more, that wants to gather around and see what this Jesus is all about. So that's what the apostle Paul does. And he gathers what, would, what we would think of as a congregation. Now, the part of the rest of the Acts chapter 17 that I'm not going to read is that because of what Paul did, a riot broke out. They went to the house of Jason to go and arrest Paul and Silas and to throw them into jail. Paul had left by that time. Paul actually had to escape from the city because the city was in such turmoil because of the reality of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's fascinating to me how the gospel impacts people's lives. Some who want to hear it and some who resist it with everything. And so the Apostle Paul goes on his way. One of the things, and this is just a little sidebar here because you all know with me, you get a couple sidebars in every sermon, whether they're intentional or not, you just get them. I am fascinated, and, and, and when I wrote my thesis, I actually wrote about some of this, but it's so interesting to me how the gospel moves. Like you think about Jesus, He never probably went into a city of more than four or five, maybe 10,000 people. He was always in small towns and all in out of the way places. But once Jesus ascends to heaven, how does the gospel move? It moves through the cities because the apostle Paul and Peter and the other apostles, they go to these larger and larger and larger cities where crowds are gathered, where they begin to hear the faith so that the faith can, can fulfill the words of Jesus when he says the faith will go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. This is happening. And this is part of what's happening in Thessalonica with the apostle Paul. But here's the reality. Paul leaves the city and he never goes back. He never, ever is able to return. In 1 Thessalonians, in the second chapter, in 18th verse, he actually says, it was Satan who prevented him. I tend to think it was the people of that city were out to get him. Paul knew that he might not survive if he were to return. And so he sent a guy by the name of Timothy, who we've looked at a couple of letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, He sent Timothy to Thessalonica at least two different times, once from Athens and once from Corinth, to deliver the letters that we now know as 1 and 2 Thessalonians. These are perhaps the first letters that the Apostle Paul ever, well, we don't know if they're the first ones that he wrote. They're the first written records that we have, probably written within a year or a year and a half of the founding of the church. And so we want to read a part of that letter today. And we're going to pick up in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to read verses 12 through 18 as Paul wraps up this letter. Here's what he writes. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. So he's speaking of leaders of the church. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Jesus. Well, I'm sure this will shock you 
But there was conflict in the church in Thessalonica. Have you ever heard of that? Churches having conflict, pastoral conflict with congregational members, leadership challenges, all this sort of stuff. Like I said, there is nothing new under the sun, right? It has been happening from the beginning of time. We should never be shocked when a church splits. We should never be shocked when people don't get along. We might be disappointed, but we should not be shocked because it has been happening from the very beginning of time. And so the Apostle Paul says this. Do you know what a terror, well, this is Pastor Paul's translation, what I think the, what Apostle Paul is saying. He is saying, do you realize what a terrible witness it is to the world when the people in the church don't get along? When we don't know how to encourage one another, when we don't know how to stand beside each other, when we don't know how to love each other well, he says that is a terrible witness to the world. So people, please live at peace. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, by the way, but also Pastor Paul. Live at peace with one another. We're not gonna agree on everything, but we can still be kind. We can still be loving. We can still be encouraging. Now, if you know anything about the letters of First and, First and Second, Second Thessalonians, you also will know that the people in Thessalonica were just waiting for the return of the Lord. Now, if you are just eagerly expecting the return of the Lord and you think it's going to happen any day and any month, any probably not even years, I don't think they were thinking that long, then you have a tendency to just be kind of lazy, particularly about your faith. Because if Jesus is returning soon, what really matters, right? Yeah, I see you all nodding your head. Thank you for that. That's, that's, that's good. Because they're like, well, Christ is returning, so we really don't have a lot that we have to worry about or a lot that we have to do. And the Apostle Paul says, no, that's absolutely wrong. You have a lot to do. You have a story to tell. You have a mission to be on. And the same is true for us today because Christ has not returned and the church is still on mission. We are still figuring out ways to let people hear and know about the good news of Jesus Christ. I have this conversation sometimes, and I'm, not, I'm usually not wise enough and quick enough to remember the response I should have, but the conversation goes something like this. Paul, I wish more people would come to our church. I look around on Sunday morning, and I wish more people were here. And my response to them that I always forget is this. When was the last time you actually invited somebody to church? And we laugh at that. But if we want the church to grow, guess what that means? We have work to do. I mean, when was the last time you actually invited somebody to church? You know how the church grows. It's not because of the preaching and teaching. Well, that's a part of it, I think. But it is by personal invitation. And I'm just gonna nudge you a little bit here and say, do you know how many events we have in this church in the next month that are the easiest way to invite anybody to church? I don't have the list up here, but there are a lot, okay? How does the church grow? Well, we invite. We have a story to tell. Okay, enough of that. We're here this morning. First of all, let me just say this. You should be so glad you showed up for church this morning because I am going to share with each and every one of you what God's will is for your life. How's that? Because people all the time are asking, like, right, what's God's will for my life? I don't really know what God's will for my life. Now, I'm not actually going to answer that question. The Apostle Paul has already answered that question for you. You, you saw it on the video screens. Remember, there were three things. See, here's the problem. We start asking ourselves, what's God's will for my life? And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm this, I have the same problem. I want to be very specific, and I want to drill down on it. I want it to be very narrow, and I want to be, like, crystal clear on this. And what the Apostle Paul does is he draws back and says, do you want to know what God's will for your life is? There's three things. Y'all remember them? Rejoice always. It's verse 16, 17, and 18, I think. Ah, oh, there they are. Do you see that last line that says, this is God's will for you? 
Just pull back the lens a little bit. Rejoice always. Pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So now, aren't you glad you showed up this morning? Because now you're like, I know Pastor Paul said, I just need to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'll figure out what God's will for my life is. But I think if we do those three things, we'll be living out what it is that God desires of our lives. Now, this morning, I don't have time to unpack all three of those things, so we are going to talk about giving thanks in all circumstances. What does it look like to live a life of gratitude. I believe that to live a life of gratitude, we have to express gratitude. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. I'm not sure if ingratitude is a word or not, but work with me on this, okay? Unexpressed gratitude is simply a lack of gratitude. Because if you are grateful for something and you have not expressed that, then that is problematic. And I will tell you that I am constantly working on this expression of gratitude. Gratitude comes very easily for some people. It's a little bit more of a struggle for some of us It's a lot of a struggle for others. But in order to be a grateful person, we have to learn how to express it. I've shared this fairly recently, I know this. Several months ago, every morning when I journal, I begin my journal with three things that I am grateful for. Because what it does is it causes me to reflect on the past 24 hours and say, God, what has happened that I'm thankful for. Now, I'm a person who kind of likes to reflect of saying, well, has that done any good for me? Right, like, great, I've been journaling for the last, well, I've been journaling for a long, long, long time, but for the last nine months or so, I don't know, I can tell you exactly when I started. I've been very intentional about saying, these three things I am grateful for every day that I journal. And the question is, well, has it helped? Well, I'll tell you this, it hasn't hurt, okay? I think it's probably helped because I'm a little bit concerned if I hadn't been doing that, I might be a more ungrateful person, right? I think that's sometimes the way in which that works. We don't always see like this huge tangible change, but it is this thing that for me, it is helpful to say, I've got to work on expressing gratitude because I'm not always great at it. I need to be intentional about being thankful. Okay, So I'm gonna put a proverb up on the screen and I'm gonna say all of us, every one of us in this room has a choice to make based on this proverb. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. A crushed spirit dries up the bones. Cheerful heart, thankful heart is good medicine. That, that, that Hebrew word there for uh, good medicine is, is, is the idea of curing. It, some, it cures or it heals. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. You see, I think every day we have to make a decision about whether we are going to be grateful or not about whether we want to be restored, about whether we want to have a cheerful spirit. Because I think what this proverb is saying is a life that does not express gratitude eventually is crushed. If we cannot figure out how to express gratitude, it literally dries up our bones. And I'm not saying that you can't have a bad day. Okay, you can ask my wife. I recently had 
you have full permission to ask, you don't get all the details of this, but you can ask her that this is true because I feel like I need to be honest with you. I am your pastor, I am your leader. I, I, and y'all have to know this, like I do have bad days, okay? I know you're shocked by this, right? Like unbelievable, the pastor. But I had a day recently where I was just, um, I have to be careful how I phrase this. Um, I was just really ungrateful, how is that? Like everything was wrong, nothing worked right. I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. My wife was being super compassionate and like saying, hey, is everything, everything, is it okay? Is it okay? I'm like, yes, it's okay, right? You know, y'all ever have these conversations? Um, But but it's just like this sense of like, there. it it was just a, it was a bad day and I was crushing my spirit and I was drying up my bones. But what matters is the next day, right? I really think the next day is what matters. Because what God did over that evening, and as I rested, he did some good internal work in my life. Because sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, the only time that God can actually get his word into your brain and into your heart is when you're asleep. Because you're too busy doing other stuff throughout the day. And so God is finally like, thank goodness you went to sleep. Right? Now I can actually get into you and share with you what really matters. And so God did that, and I am so grateful. So I wanna frame this sermon for the rest of the day around the lack of expressing gratitude and then the joy of expressing gratitude. So I think stories always help, and stories from the Bible are even better. Luke chapter 15, you may recall, which is always interesting how when Scott prays, I'm like, I'm talking about that text this morning, and I don't think Scott even knew that I'm talking about this text. Luke chapter 15 tells the story of the prodigal son. Um, I love how Tim Keller describes it. He said it's actually the story of the prodigal father, because if you think about who is the prodigal in the, prodigal means recklessly extravagant, okay? Okay. So typically when we think about the prodigal son, because that's how we've all been raised, right? He was recklessly extravagant. But so was the father, because the father in the story of the prodigal son receives that younger son home and brings him into the fam- brings him back into the family because the younger son had gotten his share of the inheritance. He'd gone away, he'd squandered everything. He came back saying, I'll just work for my father, it'll all be fine. And the father says, no, bring in the fattened calf, put the robe on him, on him, put the sandals on his feet, put the ring on his finger. He is back in the family. No father in that generation would have ever done anything like that. So Jesus is like, Do you understand the love of God the Father? He welcomes back the recklessly extravagant younger son. (laughs) That was a long setup for the story that I'm now going to read, which is the story of the older son, the one who is not grateful. So this is from the Gospel of Luke, 15th chapter, verses 25 through 32. We read this. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father, this is, again, think of the love of the father. The older brother refuses to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this, your son, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you were always with me and everything I have is yours but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. The older son in this story is obedient. The older son in this story shows up for church every Sunday, reads his Bible every day, follows the rules. And yet what has happened to his heart 
because the younger brother comes dancing in, right? Well, he doesn't really come dancing in. He comes in shamelessly, but he's brought out of the shame and given a place. And the older brother, who should have been the host of the party, refuses to come in. He has the audacity to say to his dad, you didn't even give me a fattened calf. Well, remember in the story what happened. The father had already divided up the entire inheritance. The older brother already had everything that was the father's that wasn't his younger brother's. And he has the audacity to say to his dad, you never gave me a fattened calf. And the dad could have been like, yeah, I gave you a hundred, right? But he stewed in his anger and in his self-righteousness and in his smugness. And he refused to be grateful. So much so that when his younger brother returns home, he outright refuses to join the party. You see, there is great celebration of the younger son who comes home and is who, who is restored. But he's not the only one that's lost in the story of the two sons. The older brother is just as lost, if not more. Because day after day, week after week, month after month, maybe a year after a year, he has refused to see what the Father has given him. He has refused to live with gratitude. And the result of that is a crushed spirit. No gratitude. No thank you. He could not sing. He could not dance. He could not express thankfulness that his brother had returned. The Apostle Paul puts it like this of what it is that we are to be about. Verse 5, or chapter 5 of Ephesians, he says, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the example you don't want to follow because it be, it's, it, it's incremental and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Let me give you, because we're going to end positively, right? Right? Okay. It's Thanksgiving week, people. I mean, come on, we got to end on a positive note here. Let me share with you the way in which I think we begin to pull ourselves out of the funks that we find ourselves in. Let me give you some words that, um, well, here's what I'm going to, okay, here, here's, here's the great secret. Like, I, you really should be glad you came in for church today because not only, not only did you figure out what God's will for your life is, right? You remember those three things? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. I'm going to give you a prayer for Thanksgiving. Okay, because some of you, you're like, you're like, I know someone's going to have to pray. See, when you, when, like my parents, they got it easy because both their kids are pastors. So it's like they never have to worry about a meal, a prayer for anything. If they want the long prayer, they have me pray. If they want the short prayer, they have my brother who's Episcopalian pray, right? You know, it's like they, they figured all this out, like how much time do we have before we, you know, how hungry is everybody? So um, just, I'm just being honest about that, by the way. But here's the deal. I want to look at Psalm 103, and I want to look at the first five verses. And if this psalm does not turn your heart to the living God, I don't know what will. But it's also just a great psalm of thanksgiving. We're going to use, I haven't even told my family yet, because they're going to look at me to pray on Thanksgiving Day, right? Because, hey, he's a preacher. I'm going to look at my daughter, who's a high school director at a church, and say, you work at a church too, right? So, but listen to these words. This is the first five verses, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All, actually, it's interesting. Psalm 103 ends, begins and ends with that line. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
And now here come these five things. What has God done? Who forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Isn't that beautiful? Like, this is what I have. Like, what has God done for me? He's forgiven my sins. He's restored my relationship. He's healed the diseases. He redeems my life from the pit. Crowned with love and compassion. Satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed. Right, like that's, we, we, we need this renewal. We need a refreshment. We need, because the world sometimes stinks, right? Like we look at our circumstances. That's why I'm so amazed at what Abraham Lincoln did with the day of Thanksgiving. He said, even in the midst of this God-awful, God-forsaken war, where so many lives are being taken, we must pause and remember our generous Father. Psalm 103, if you read Psalm 102, you realize that Israel's not doing great. There's all sorts of problems. There's all sorts of calamity. And Psalm 103 comes back and says, yes, but continue to praise God and do not forget the benefits that God gives you. I think as we grow in our faith, because remember we spent 10 weeks talking about What does it look like to be formed by God? What is spiritual formation all about? I believe that as we grow in our faith, we are actually able to give thanks in more profound ways because we look back on our life and we see how God got us through, how God made a way, how God helped to mature us and refine us. As we grow in Jesus, our perspective changes. So what choice will you make? A crushed spirit that dries up the bones or a grateful heart that brings healing and wholeness? I pray that we will be a church and a community. I pray that we will be individuals who choose to rejoice always, who choose to pray continually, and who choose to give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that the living God is with us. God will not abandon us. God will not forsake us. Amen. Pray with me, please. God, you have been with us in all of life. The nation of Israel struggled. Our own nation struggled. We struggle. We despair at times, Lord, and the teaching of the older son is a scary one because our hearts become so hardened and our bones become so calloused and our spirits become so crushed. We refuse to enter in to the glory of the party. We refuse to see what your grace has done. Lord, may we not live in such a way, but may we instead choose joy. May we be gratefully reminded and may we be encouraged that, God, you are always with us and that your benefits to us are so great. Your steadfast mercy never ceases. Make us people of joy who pray always and who are able to give thanks in all circumstances. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.